Thank you very much, Kay. I appreciate it. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. And um, I have some people to thank in addition to, um, to Kay for um, organizing this. Uh, this was uh, Ed Borden's idea uh, to, uh, to have me come down, so thank you. I hope you're not sorry for, uh, for bringing me down to talk to you about hip hop. Uh, but also in my um, work as uh, director of the Institute for Arts and Humanities, I have, I've had a, a strong uh, Goldsboro connection um, with the uh, Borden family, also the, the Wheel family. And uh, in fact, there was a nice um, connection, uh, Goldsboro connection, the last time that we hosted uh, the Wheel uh, lecture in American citizenship, which uh, my institute um, runs, we had uh, Reverend Barber um, uh, with us, so a lot of uh, a lot of uh, famous Goldsboro residents um, coming to see us. So uh, so it really uh, delights me to be able to come here to talk to um, talk to all of you and to uh, to have another chance to visit um, Goldsboro. So um, before um, I get uh, I get started, I want to show you. Before I get started talking particularly about uh, hip hop and diplomacy, I want to show you a little a little video. Um, so this is a, a short and uh, kind of rather silly uh, video uh, that I took when I was in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, a couple years ago, um, as part of a State Department funded cultural diplomacy program that I'll be telling you more about. It's called Next Level. So. Um, it demonstrates something that I've seen over and over again, which is the power of, uh, in this case, music, but in, in general, the arts, to connect people of different backgrounds, different cultures, different races, different languages. And what we have here is we have two people who had never met before. Um, we were in, um, in uh, Dar es Salaam, and um, we, met, uh, we met this uh, woman over here on your right, and uh, the man on the left is um, a beatboxer. So he's a hip hop artist who does her vocal uh, percussion. So they couldn't speak to each other because uh, he, he doesn't speak Swahili and, and she doesn't speak English. But I want you to watch this video of them um, meeting for the first time and making music together. <laughs> okay, so that was just something I took on my phone uh, very spontaneously. But what's kind of remarkable about this about this scene is that two people who have no connection, no connection at all, they can't speak to each other, their histories are completely different. She's Muslim, he's Jewish, he's American, she's Tanzanian. Um, they, they have no, no friends in common, uh, uh, to put it uh, mildly. Um, and after 30 seconds, did you see what was happening? They were smiling, they were laughing, they had a connection, a bond had formed. So that is the basis of, of what I want to talk to you about and what, uh, what really captures what I think is powerful and even magical about the work that I do at the State Department. Um, I'll be getting more into that, but I wanted to, I wanted to give you a little taste of, uh, of what happens before I start giving you some background, um, just to prepare things. Okay, so I actually have some questions for you. The first uh, question I have is, what comes to mind when you think of the word diplomacy? So just images. When you think of diplomacy or diplomats, what do you see in your head? What do the diplomats look like? What are they doing? What's, you know, just visually. So it's not a rhetorical question. I'd like to uh, hear what you think. So diplomacy, what comes to mind? Yes. Negotiators. Negotiators. OK, so. Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger, OK, good. Uh, what else? What are some? What are some thoughts or images? Handshakes. 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 Okay, good. What else? Did, what's that? Discussion. Advocates. What else, sir? Discussion. Discussion. Advocates. Handshakes. Um, also, how would you describe sort of the the, the visual appearance of diplomats? Formal. Okay, formal. Dark suits. Dark suits. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Men. Men. Okay, men. Okay, so I did a uh, I did a search on the internet under Google Images for um, diplomacy, and um, and so what did I find? Um, men in suits shaking hands. <laughs> so uh, all the things that you just said. Um, they're they're negotiating. You also see flags, lots of flags. Diplomacy for whatever not whatever reason, but represents the different countries. Uh, lots of flags and maps. Um, but you see they're wearing suits. They're mostly they're all men in these images. Um, they also happen to be all white men uh, wearing suits. So um, so these are kind of the standard images that uh, that often come to mind um, when uh, when we talk about diplomacy. So now let me. Uh, ask you another question. What about hip hop? When you uh, when you just think of the word hip hop or think of hip hop artists, what images come to mind? Poetry. Poetry. All right, I like that. For me, it starts. Okay, poetry. Okay, and how are people? Are they reading poetry and books? How are they delivering poetry? Um. Um. What do you mean? Um, they, what? Do you what like how are they? How are they performing it? Um, Ad lib. Technology. Microphones. Okay, so so poetry with microphones. And what do you call hip hop poetry delivered through microphones? Anybody know? Uh, rap. 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 You've heard of rap, right? Okay, so <laughs> rap. Right. So okay, so images. Uh, people delivering poetry um, with microphones. Uh, what are some other images? Just pictures that come yeah, to mind. Yeah. Young guys, okay, young. Not well dressed. <laughs> casually dressed. Casually dressed. Let's say casually dressed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hats. Yes, uh, baseball, flat bill caps. Okay. Jeans. Okay. Um, probably baggy jeans. Okay. I heard someone say chains. Okay. Jewelry. Jewelry. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, so I did, I did a search uh, for hip hop as well. Um, and so what, what comes up? Um, men in baseball caps holding microphones. Um, also some other images, graffiti. Um, it's a little small, but the uh, boom box. Um, uh, also, you know, break dancing and so on. So, okay, so the point, uh, that I'm actually just reinforcing here is just how unlikely the partnership between these two things might seem. Because on the one hand, you have, um, you have uh, formally dressed people in suits, shaking hands. It's kind of contained, um, conservative. Um, often it's white men uh, representing uh, these states. Um, not always, of course, but those are the kind of stereotypical images. And then uh, hip hop, you have a very different uh, set of images. Uh, it's more um, uh, kind of loose and, uh, and exuberant and energetic and casual and informal. And, um, and it tends to be um, not white men in suits, but the stereotypical images are black men holding microphones uh, and wearing baseball caps. Now, actually, both those are a little um, limited in their scope because, um, of course, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton was uh, Secretary of State, this country's top diplomat. Um, you, have, uh, you have plenty of uh, hip hop artists who are women, who are white, who um, occasionally dress in suits. Uh, but, uh, but the point is that these two things, um, for most people, don't seem to go together. Um, and yet, what I've been doing for the last uh, four years and traveling around the world um, running is a hip hop and diplomacy program. So the reason I'm here is to talk about that partnership of hip hop and diplomacy to tell you about what that means, what hip hop diplomacy means, why it works. I'm going to make an argument um, because I, I believe in it. I've been running this program and I've seen over and over again how this type of what's called cultural diplomacy, not the formal diplomacy of, of diplomats making, um, you know, coming to agreements or accords, but, um, but cultural diplomacy in which the citizens of different countries come together. Um, it's also called people-to-people -people diplomacy and why that works. 
and, um, and talk to you about this phenomenon that you've probably never heard of, uh, but uh, hopefully you will um, uh, enjoy hearing about and, um, and maybe even come to believe that, that as I do, this is a really powerful form of diplomacy. So then let me just um, answer the question, what exactly is hip hop diplomacy? So hip hop diplomacy is a form of public diplomacy, or as I mentioned, person to person or people to people diplomacy that uses hip hop music, dance and culture to foster mutual understanding, appreciation and cooperation among people of different cultures. So again, uh, in the term, in terms of diplomacy, you have the kind of formal diplomacy, which are people who are trained as diplomats, their job, uh, they may be ambassadors, it may be the, the Secretary of State, uh, they may be ministers, people come together to try to hammer out agreements uh, between two countries. But there's also a form of diplomacy that is um, more informal, and it's based on people who are citizens, not not uh, uh, civil servants, not foreign service officers, but just citizens of the countries coming together to meet, to, um, to build bridges and to promote um, understanding and cooperation. So uh, cultural diplomacy is a form of uh, this kind of people to people diplomacy that uses culture as the platform. So it could be anything. There's every, any kind of culture that you can imagine has had a corresponding form of diplomacy. So there has been jazz diplomacy. In fact, some of you may have heard of this uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, people like Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong, Dave Brubeck, and others were sent by the State Department all around the world to perform. And it was, uh, they were considered a Cold War weapon or a weapon in the fight against the Soviet Union. And part of the reason um, at that time was uh, to try to prove to the Soviet Union that we had culture too. Um, and, uh, uh, and also to demonstrate that our people were free and unlike their people. So it was, um, it was an honest, authentic means of connecting people, but at the same time, it was a form of propaganda. Um, it was a war of propaganda. So there is a precedent to, uh, to hip hop diplomacy, the jazz diplomacy, but there's sports diplomacy, there's uh, culinary diplomacy where chefs go and, uh, and uh, work with other chefs using food as the platform uh, for connecting. So there's all sorts of kinds of uh, diplomacy. Um, so let me tell you about the particular uh, program that I run, which is called Next Level. So Next Level is an initiative of the U.S. Department of State, uh, particularly the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, that sends teams of U.S. hip hop artists abroad to work with underserved communities, usually with uh, young people, and it's to promote cultural exchange, entrepreneurship, and conflict reduction or uh, conflict transformation. And, um, and it's a program that I actually created in, uh, in 2013. Um, a call was put out to, um, to various arts organizations and universities by the State Department looking for an organization to create this new program. And it was, uh, it was fairly vague. They said they wanted hip hop or some kind of urban music as a means to connect people and they kind of left a lot of things open. And so um, you might ask, well, how is it that I had the idea to apply for this? Well, actually, I'd been teaching um, hip hop classes for quite a while, and part of my research for the past now 20 years has been in hip hop. And the way it started is that I would teach these courses and I would bring hip hop artists into the class to meet with students. And then I would start collaborating more and more with these hip hop artists. And eventually I started teaching a class um, called Beat Making Lab with, um, with a hip hop producer. And then the next step of that was uh, we raised money and uh, I sent uh, these two hip hop artists to the Congo to work at a, uh, a youth center run actually by one of my wonderful colleagues, Cherie and Delico, and, uh, and they taught um, hip hop to young Congolese um, uh, teenagers and, uh, and young adults 
and um, made a video about it. And it became so popular on YouTube that PBS got interested, commissioned several more of these trips. And so after a while, I was helping to head up this international program that sent, uh, that sent these hip hop artists around the world. So uh, that was in 2012, 2013, the call came out for, these, uh, for this proposal to create this program and I thought it's very much like what I'm doing now but this is on a bigger scale. So I applied, um, it's one of these things where I applied, it was a massive, massive application and then I didn't hear anything from them for six months. And then I got a call, this tells you a little bit about, the, about bureaucracy, I got a call from a program officer and she said, well I can't tell you whether you've gotten it yet but can you answer this question? what would you do with another $160,000 with this program? I said, okay, so I don't have it, but just hypothetically, <laughs> if I did, what would I do with that? Um, and so, uh, so I came up with a good answer, and then, um, it, and then a couple of weeks later, they said, okay, you got it. Uh, it turns out they had some extra money, and before they told me I got it, um, they wanted to know what I would do with this extra money. So anyway, I've now been running this program um, for uh, four years. Well, it started in 2013, so it's, it's actually been five years, but our first residencies were in 2014. So um, since 2014, we visited actually 28 countries. Um, so I need to update my, uh, my bio on my website because I think it said something like 12 or 15. But, um, but from Azerbaijan to Zimbabwe, this happens to be a news broadcast in Serbia um, about our program. So um, what we do is we take teams of hip hop artists, each in a different discipline of hip hop. So rappers, dancers, DJs, um, beat makers who compose beats. We bring graffiti artists. We also bring beatboxers. And we kind of mix it up. We bring four of each. And we have these workshops uh, that run two weeks where we will work with up to a hundred young people um, and it's very intensive. They come in for three or four hours a day. They take, the, they take classes they, um, and what we do is we don't just teach the craft of hip hop, how to rap or how to rap better, dance or dance better and so on, but we also talk about things like entrepreneurship how to create your own, uh, your own business out of hip hop or how to apply um, sort of hip hop entrepreneurship to the things that they might want to do in their lives. We also do a lot of work in um, conflict resolution where we, uh, where we use hip hop as a way to channel um, and sublimate violence and, and aggression into more positive ways. So I know a lot of you might uh, have an impression that hip hop is, is violent, um, but and, and in fact, there, it, it can be, and, the, and lyrics can, can express violence, but in fact, the whole history of hip hop is you, the use of art to channel violence into something creative. So the, pre, the people who created hip hop, many of them either were surrounded by uh, violence in terms of gangs or were even parts, part of gangs and they um, wanted a way out of, of this violence. And what they did is they created these art forms that seemed to simulate violence um, in terms of the way they rap or the way they gesture or they dance. Um, but it was a way to channel that aggression to something more positive. So it turns out that conflict resolution is really a, a, a perfect, um, or I should say hip hop is a perfect vehicle for conflict resolution because it built at its core is taking violent or aggressive tendencies and turning them into art. So that's also one of the things I want you to take away from, uh, from this lecture, which is uh, I do want to challenge some of your preconceptions about hip hop. Um, some of them might be correct in some ways, but, um, but what you might think of as hip hop in terms of uh, the images that you see are often just the, a very small slice of hip hop. There are hundreds, thousands of hip hop artists who, um, who don't advocate for violence. They, uh, they, might, uh, they might be activists in their community. They might be using hip hop to educate. They might be using it to promote human rights. 
And those are the kinds of hip hop artists that we work with. Um, so I want to show you um, a little uh, video of um, one of our next level residencies that happened uh, February 2018 in Myanmar, um, also known as Burma. Um, and uh, here's just a little, it's a two minute video of, uh, of what was happening, um, just sort of capturing sense of what was happening in uh, Myanmar. And you'll see me as well, um, but that's not why I chose this. <laughs> I just want to reiterate how hip hop is not simply music or fashion, it's a whole lifestyle, it's a whole culture. That is why we are here, it's because we feel like we are part of the same culture. Even though we're from the United States and we're from Myanmar, we're all part of the same hip hop. <laughs> You know, one interesting thing about, uh, well, there are lots of interesting things about that, but one thing I want to point out, I don't know if you, if you remember where uh, the dancer, the, our dance instructor who, who goes by the name Tsunami, um, just started dancing and someone started dancing with her yeah. and they were moving together. So that's kind of a, a microcosm of what happens is that people connect with each other and they start working together even if they can't speak to each other, or understand each other. And, and there's something called um, kinesthetic empathy, which actually is a really interesting concept that, uh, that means that, that you can create a connection with something through movement and by moving in the same way other people move. And you can create a bond. I mean, it happens all the time in very small ways. For example, if you're nodding right now, um, and I'm nodding, you know, right, right, we're connecting, right, I'm connecting with you right there. Um, and, um, uh, and it's something that's very basic to human behavior, which is movement that is mirrored by other people. So we do that with Next Level. It's this way of, of cutting across the other barriers that we might not be able to cross because of language or history um, or culture or religion or any number of differences. Okay, so I'm going to play for you one more, uh, one more video. I have so many videos, but I won't just play through all of them. Um, and, uh, and this, um, whoops, sorry, let's, okay. Um, hold on one second. Um, let, me, let me make sure, oh, here it is, okay. Um, so here's, here's one more that I just wanted to show you about um, uh, that took place in El Salvador. Um, this uh, a place that, um, that has the highest murder rate in the world, uh, uh, just riven by violence. 
and uh, young people really love hip hop because it's a it's a constructive way to um, to express themselves. It's also a way they can they can create jobs and their own identities and to follow uh, their own paths. So here is a little bit. Um, this is uh, one of uh, the uh, rappers uh, that was working, uh, Salvadoran rappers that was working with the rapper that we brought in. Her name is Medusa. And, uh, and he talks a little bit about her. And then you'll hear him rap as well. Um, so. <laughs> Formo parte de racismo y afimes. El proyecto Next Level cambió mi vida porque yo tengo más de ocho años de hacer música de una manera, pero con la intervención de Medusa, que fue nuestra mentora, nos dio herramientas para hacer las cosas mucho más fáciles, tener mayor presencia y aparte nos da los ánimos de seguir haciendo música. Cuando vemos gente de ese nivel, con la humildad que maneja, y con el amor con el que le enseña uno le da ánimos para seguir haciendo hip hop y seguir transmitiendo de las nuevas generaciones y a través de la música, el arte y el hip hop poder cambiar nuestra realidad social. Desde el barrio, la Rosario, con criterios como Acuario, el universitario, es un hotel que ven en el diario, el empresario, es un empresario que da un salario precario, señora maquillera que se esmera para poder pagar la pobreza en casa, con el mano en mesa, aunque se acaba la cosa, se expresa madre soltera, sueño va a ser enfermera, no se pudo, pero lucha porque su hija lo sea, y vivo en donde casa, parece en un horno, en los cuartos viven nueve financiadas por el fondo, con So um, I hope you're able to read the, uh, uh, the subtitles or understand Spanish. Um, but, um, but I think what he was saying was really powerful. First of all, he was talking about, um, oh, oh, sorry. OK, I'll move the other one. Um, so I'll just quickly summarize. Uh, he was, there are two parts to this. One where he was talking about the connection he had with the American um, instructor, Medusa, and how um, he felt you know, really honored to work with her and that um, and that, uh, that connection was helping him and, um, and uh, the people of his community. And then he came up and, and rapped. Um, that was one of their assignments, was to talk about their own experience. And so he talked about his neighborhood, his hood. And he talked about just, at first you might think he's talking about just how horrible it is. They live in houses like ovens, they have no money, they have to borrow money just for tortillas at lunch and so on. Um, and then he ends up by saying how, how much he loves his neighborhood. So it's a, it's a powerful statement that he's making. He's talking about, about life in El Salvador. He's using art to talk about life in El Salvador. And he's also talking about, how, about his love for his country. And, uh, and so these are the types of things that we try to foster. Um, you know, he could have, you could imagine a very different path where he's faced with the same, the same trials, the same tribulations, but decides that he has to um, you know, feed his family by, um, by selling drugs or get, falls in with a gang. But he's able to use his art to find a different path. So that's why I'm, um, I think this is such a powerful, a powerful tool, hip hop diplomacy. So let me um, uh, just go back for a moment and just ask the question, why hip hop? Why is it that hip hop is a powerful platform? Why not, um, I don't know, um, you know, barbershop quartets, say, um, or, you know, or death metal. I don't know. I mean, it's possible all those would work. But, um, but there are some particular, uh, particular things about hip hop that are 
that are really kind of crucial. Um, one is that it's popular. It's not just popular, it's globally popular. And in fact, it's the most listened to music genre on the planet. So what that means is that wherever we go, there are people who know hip hop. So that means we have a means to connect with them. So we're not trying to teach them viola. Um, they already know, uh, know hip hop. They may know viola too. But um, another thing is that it's, uh, it's popular among young people. And uh, that demographic is the, is the fastest growing demographic in the world. It is uh, the demographic that all governments need to pay attention to because not only obviously they're the future, but they're also the key to revolutions. Um, they, could, they could foment revolution, they, can, they, can, uh, they could be revolutionaries, they could be terrorists, they could be uh, business people, they could be philanthropists, um, but uh, whatever, whatever potential they have, they need to be, they need to be understood and, they, and, and need to be um, uh, um, sort of paid attention to and cultivated. So it's a really important um, demographic. Um, I mentioned that it's global, it's everywhere we go. I once did a little experiment. I pulled up the list of 198 countries recognized by the United Nations and then Googled that country name plus hip hop just to see if there's hip hop going, in that, going on in that country. I could not find a country that did not have stories about hip hop in their local communities. And that includes little island nations in the middle of the Pacific. Um, so it's global, it's everywhere. Um, also, one thing that's really important is it's, it's accessible, meaning that anybody can, can practice hip hop. If you have a body or a voice, you can do it. Um, you can rap, you can dance, you could beatbox. And in fact, um, I've, I've worked with a number of disabled hip hop artists who um, are able to uh, make hip hop accommodate their bodies rather than the other way around. So one of the, should have uh, shown you this video too because uh, it's incredible. I met this uh, amazing um, dancer, it's break dancer in Brazil, who, um, uh, who can do the most amazing spins and flips and, and uh, you know, everyone thinks he's one of the great, uh, great hip hop dancers. He has one leg. Um, he lost one of his legs to cancer when he was a child. And, uh, and he, uh, he didn't let that stop him and he was able to, um, to win competitions and perfect his craft. And we met with him in Brazil when we had a, a program in Brazil. And one of the, the great stories of this program is that uh, we brought um, one of the great American hip hop uh, dancers who goes by the name Cujo, because he's such a beast. Um, and, uh, and those two hit it off, uh, the, the Brazilian um, b-boy or break dancer and um, Cujo and Cujo brought him onto his crew and what's interesting he has a crew a group um, that's all made up of, of disabled uh, dancers um, because um, Cujo you might find this hard to believe is deaf um, and he is one of the world's great uh, 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 dancers um, he can hear just a teeny bit uh, but mostly it's just feeling vibrations and so he has a crew, they're called Ill Abilities. Um, and, um, and they travel all around the world. And they brought this um, Brazilian dancer who goes by the name of Samuka onto the team. Samuka had never left his, his country. Um, he had, the furthest he had been was to the next state over. And since then, he has now been to, I think, about 10 different countries with this crew uh, performing. He per they performed for the president of Singapore. They, uh, he's won battles in Switzerland. He's been to Los Angeles. Completely changed his life through this connection, this, uh, this program. Um, finally, I say it's uh, resonant um, in that um, hip hop resonates with young people all around the world because of its story. Um, the story, and I won't go into the whole the whole origin um, was that uh, it was started by young people who had no, no money. They lived in the South Bronx. This was in the 70s. Um, it was a, a difficult time, a difficult place to live. But they created what they, they say is something out of nothing. 
and, they, and what they did, these teenagers, created this art form that became an industry and a global phenomenon. So people everywhere look at that and are inspired. So put this all together, and you could see why the State Department would love to use hip-hop as a way to connect people because hip-hop is American. And, and people all around the world who like hip-hop know that hip-hop was born in the Bronx, born in the United States, and they revere the United States because of that. And that's a good thing because not everyone in the world reveres the US. Um, in fact, lots of people don't really like this country. Um, and some of them may have good reason, some of them uh, may not have such good reason, but it's simply a fact that, um, that uh, these, um, these, community, these countries around the world often have very low approval ratings of the US. So here is something that is American and that people, young people all around the world love. So it's actually not, when you think about it, particularly unlikely. In fact, it makes perfect sense uh, to, uh, to promote um, global connection through hip hop. So I want to show you a, a couple, uh, sort of talk through a couple other points and uh, about uh, hip hop diplomacy and also talk about some of the, um, some of the potential pitfalls too, because so far I've been making it sound great and wonderful, but any kind of diplomacy also has its risks. So, um, so let, me, let me move here. And actually before, uh, before I talk about the risks, I, I do want to uh, share with you some of, the, um, some of the feedback we've gotten about why in particular it's powerful. So here are some, we, um, here are some responses from the evaluations we do. We always do um, surveys at the end of program, every program. And this picture is from Bangladesh. They're holding up their, um, their certificates. And so here's some of the things they said. Cooperation is the healing of all nations. Passion, creativity, and tolerance are the keys to success. Um, working with the next level team has broadened my mind. They came to empower us. We know that they care for us. I've learned from the best on how to shape my action through my art. I consider it a blessing from distant relatives. Peace. That's really powerful to think about um, how hip hop, there's this global hip hop family. And actually that people say that when they go to another country and they meet someone who's also a hip hop artist and within seconds they're performing together, they treat each other as, as brothers or sisters or even as cousins. Um, and, uh, and it's a powerful connection. Lots more I could say about how hip hop can facilitate cross-cultural exchange, mutual cooperation, and even peace. But I do want to say that doing good is harder than it sounds. OK. So here's a picture of me uh, with a whole bunch of uh, hip hop artists in El Salvador. Um, but what I want to say is that, and I, I use El Salvador uh, for a particular uh, reason. Um, we went to El Salvador. And, um, and I don't know how much you might know about the history of, of uh, American intervention in El Salvador, but they had a, a, a terrible, bloody civil war that lasted more than a decade. Uh, the United States uh, supported um, uh, right wing, the, the, the right wing uh, side of it, um, and in fact, ended up um, supporting death squads and um, uh, that killed many uh, Salvadorans. And then um, many, many Salvadorans fled um, El Salvador because of the violence. May they came to the US. Many of them uh, settled in California. Um, over the 1990s, um, some of these Salvadorans formed these gangs. Um, one of them was called MS-13, which you may have uh, heard of. Uh, there were some other uh, gangs. And then what happened was they, um, the US started deporting them back to El Salvador. Many of them had not known El Salvador. They, they came up as kids, small group of them, as with any percentage of the population, fell into criminal activity. Um, then they were deported back to El Salvador. So the US, think about this, the US uh, intervened in their country, drove people into our country, 
Then when some of them uh, became criminals, we send them back to their country where they became even more violent. And now um, El Salvador has uh, the highest murder uh, rate in the world. Uh, and the same is uh, similar is true to Honduras. Now there's, there, you know, it, it's more complex than that. But think of it this way. Then I go to El Salvador with some hip hop artists and say, hey, we're going to help you. Um, <laughs> We're going to rap together and make your lives better. Um, so it's not so simple to run this kind of program where, where we just go in and, and we're this um, uh, you know, uh, beneficent force. Um, the US has a, has a very distinctive relationship with many of the world's countries. And sometimes it's not been a, a positive one. Um, sometimes. We've uh, undermined, maybe we've uh, had the best of intentions, but sometimes we've undermined um, a democracy in their countries or, or the uh, you know, particular uh, rulers. Um, so, um, and sometimes we've, we've picked the wrong sides, the ones that, that ended up um, you know, committing uh, violence against their own people. So that means this is a fraught enterprise. Anytime I go into another country, that the US has had a long history with, which is pretty much every country, um, I have to be really thinking about these things. So that's why I say that doing, doing good is harder than it sounds. So these are some of the things that, um, that I emphasize when uh, we have our orientation session with the hip hop artists, the US hip hop artists going abroad. We talk about how important it is to understand the context in which they're going. We tell them to listen and not just speak. We want them to be humble and show respect for the people that they work with. We want them to emphasize process over product so it's not just about getting to the final performance but making sure that they do it the right way. We want to understand that we come from a privileged position being in the US. Um, I have so many stories of, of having my privileges sort of uh, um, un, um, you know, revealed to me, for example, when I was in Uganda and took some, took some of the uh, kids out for, uh, for lunch and bought them $1 slices of pizza, uh, they told me that was the first time they had eaten pizza. Um, because to spend a dollar on pizza would be crazy for them because that could feed their family for a whole day. Um, so they had never had pizza before. Um, and I thought, oh, I, you know, I'm just throwing out dollars like, you know, because I'm, I'm suddenly rich because $10 buys them um, untold you know, feasts. So things like that, which we just don't think about. Um, and then also reciprocate and collaborate. Make sure that it's, we're not just going in and it's a one-sided um, uh, one uh, kind of interaction, but we're really working together. So, so I might ask, what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> I am happy to say that we've never had gigantic explosions um, erupting because of our uh, workshops, but there are things that could go wrong. So um, here are some things that, that we really need to be careful about when we're working in another country as Americans. Um, one is what's called cultural imperialism, meaning that we have to be careful that we're um, not just we're, we're, we're sharing culture and we're not imposing our culture or our ways on others because we don't want them to be like us. We want them to be however they want to be and to determine that. Um, but there, um, there have been plenty of times in history of various countries and groups where, where groups go out and try to um, change the way people do things and impose their way of life or their culture on others. So we want to be careful not to do that. We want to, we want to uh, appreciate their own autonomy and their own way of doing things. Another is kind of the opposite cultural appropriation that we could go in, you know, imagine, and this could, this could happen, imagine we go into a country with a Muslim majority where every day um, you hear the call to prayer coming from the mosques and um, uh, a DJ said, oh, that's cool. I'm going to record that and put it on a record and scratch it and rap over it. Um, that would be incredibly offensive uh, to do that because that's, that's sacred uh, performance and that would be considered um, haram or, or forbidden to do such things. So there are all sorts of ways that we could appropriate culture and, and by doing that be insensitive. Another thing is that we could actually make things worse. Um, 
and and that can happen even if we don't try. Um, uh, so, so we could go in and we because we don't know. Let's say this is the group I'm in. I'm in uh, Serbia, and I don't realize that this side of the room hates that side of the room. And you know, you're from one uh, crew and you're from another crew, and I brought you together. And I could actually, without you know, without trying understanding what's going on, I could. It could be better that you're not in the same room. Um, and maybe it's better I could try to work things out. That's where a conflict transformation comes in. But in fact, there have been times where we've seen tensions flare. And that can happen however, however hard you try to avoid that. But these are the realities. OK, so you can bring in new tensions. You can worsen tensions. OK, so a couple of conclusions. And then I'd uh, love to open this up for discussion. So these are. Th some of the things that I take away from, from my work uh, through Next Level. One is that cross-cultural interactions can promote mutual understanding and foster peaceful relations. Hopefully you've seen that in some of the examples. On the other hand, they could also do harm. Um, but also that music and the arts in general can be a potent means of promoting cross-cultural exchange. Um, and finally, um, I'm happy to say that uh, my next book, I just finished a draft of my next book, which is about this subject. I finished on Friday, and then, um, uh, so I'd have time to prepare for today. And, um, and I thought I would share for you uh, the last sentence uh, that I wrote. So I, I write in this book, um, hip hop, a US born art form that has become a voice of struggle and celebration worldwide has the power to build global community at a time when it is so desperately needed. So thank you. Yes. So I hope I didn't go too long, but I'd be happy to take some questions. Yes. How can you recruit the people that go with you? OK, so recruiting, good question. We actually, it's an, it's a, um, the way we recruit the artists that go with us, it's a, a national competition, actually. So we put out a call for applications. People have to apply with uh, written statements about why they want to do this, why they're uh, qualified to do it. And they also have to send us um, some uh, work samples of their rapping, their dancing, their DJing, and so on. And we get many, many, many more applications than we have slots to fill. So it's very competitive. Yes. So do you keep up with the um, with the people you meet in foreign countries and see how they're doing and, and going forward? And do you ever bring them back to the United States? Um, yes and yes. So the question was, do we keep up with them and do we bring them to the US? One thing uh, that, uh, that I didn't mention is that every cycle, a cycle is uh, either five to seven countries uh, that we go to. At the end of each cycle, we bring one artist one participant from each of those countries as a team back to the US for a two week residency where they do um, uh, basically um, arts and uh, professional development um, workshops. And then the idea is that we want to give them um, tools to, uh, to really lead their own communities uh, back, uh, back home. But in terms of keeping up with people every single day. So I'll just get a Facebook message that says, Mr. Mark, they call me Mr. Mark, uh, or sometimes Dr. Mark. Um, you know, how are you doing? So I was just corresponding with a, with a, a young man in Uganda who's studying social work, and um, and he just wanted to see how I was doing. Um, uh, on a sadder side, um, in Egypt, um, one of the artists that we worked with died tragically uh, in a car uh, car crash. So we posted something on our Facebook uh, page uh, as a tribute to him, and we uh, we we put it in English and Arabic, and and it was a, it was a small gesture, but um, but his community really appreciated that we were that we cared enough to uh, to write and. Um, I'm in touch with people from all of the places I've been. So that's that's a, a that's what's in, that's another important component is what we call the follow-on activity. Okay, I have another question. Sure. That. So where do you where do they perform when they come back to the United States? Are they based in Chapel Hill? <coughs> or are you in North Carolina? Or do you go all over the country? So uh, where they come, it it is varied. Uh, they have spent time in Chapel Hill. 
They've performed in various uh, elementary and high, uh, middle schools that happen to be the ones my daughter goes to. Um, <laughs> She still doesn't think I'm cool, though. So, um, but um, they've performed on campus. But they also go to Washington, D.C. and New York. Uh, so it's, a, it's either two or three sites uh, that they go to uh, where they'll do workshops and perform. Yes? Have they ever visited a community college? Um, they, well, I'm trying to think. I don't know. Should I bring a, should I bring a group to uh, yes. Wayne Community College? OK. <laughs> All right. Well, then this talk was a success. If you want me to, <laughs> if you want me to come back, I can. I know that. Yes. Um, I understand that this is a State Department program, but given the current culture of polarization in this country, has there ever been any thought to bring hip hop diplomacy to the United States? That is an excellent question. Um, not just because I have that same question, um, <laughs> but should. Why are we just doing this internationally? Why not domestically? That's something I think about a lot. Practically speaking, the State Department doesn't do domestic work. But um, in fact, just today, I put in an application for a grant um, that would allow me to create programs like this in the US. So absolutely. And in fact, it does happen. It happens more, more kind of organically uh, in various communities. But, um, but imagine people coming together to dance or, or rap and, and bef before they know what their, each other's political persuasion is. And then afterwards, they might think, you know what? I actually don't have to hate you because you voted uh, different from the way I do um, because we've already made this connection. So that may sound simple, but I do think, I do think there's, some, there's something to that. And I would love to try that here. Yes. On your team that is more uh, formally trained in conflict resolution, or does that just fall on your shoulders and, and your hip hop? Um, so, do do we have anybody on our team uh, trained in conflict resolution? Um, yes, we consult with um, actually a, a UNC alum named Arthur Romano, who uh, now teaches at George Mason University in their conflict. Um, uh, I think it's called conflict resolution studies or conflict studies. So we have him come to all of our orientation sessions and he does workshops um, in conflict um, resolution. Um, but this grant that I just applied for today was actually to deepen that part of it. And I want to become formally trained in that so that I can run programs too. So I've been inspired by that aspect of it. and. Um, and I'm, I've started to take workshops in conflict re, um, transformation, conflict resolution, so that I can lead some of these things. Yes. Um, when is the next audition for um, um, Novus Hip Hop Artists? Okay, so uh, the next uh, next applications will be open um, in a few weeks. In a few weeks. Yeah. Will it be posted up in? Uh, on the old school bulletin. Um, well, it'll be um, the. Well, you can, you can ask me and I'll send it to you. Um, because we try to disseminate it as widely as possible. And you know, we try to get everywhere we possibly can. But if you ask me, I'll send it to you and make sure that you see it. If you want to uh, send it to people that you okay. think might You're be interested. Facebook? Yes. Okay. And Next Level is also. Um, you know what? I think somewhere there's a, a, a Facebook address. But you could just, uh, it's Next Level USA is the Facebook address. See, right now they're in Turkey. And um, I would be in Turkey, but I'm here with you. Um, and, um, and so I'm watching what they're up to. So you could see what they're doing in Turkey right now. But yes, there's uh, Facebook, Instagram. We have a website, Twitter, all those things. Cool. Oh, do you have a I just I want to go plug real quick. They have a YouTube channel as well that shows some of their other trips that they've been on. Oh, yes, I forgot. And um, I, I spent one afternoon just watching video after video. And it's amazing to see the connections that they have with these different people in the, around the world. So please check out their YouTube page, Next Level, as well. Thank you, Next Level USA. So uh, thank you for that plug. I <laughs> forgot that that was one of our, our uh, channels. But um, well, I appreciate your, your great questions. Oh, yes, sir. I'm curious in your travels. You know, we talk a lot about how it, it Hip hop brings communities together in various cultures. Did you notice any differences um, 
between, say, American hip hop. You know, I, when I've been to Europe, what I've noticed is, and I think it's finally gotten hold here, but the DJs in Europe are just as popular as the rappers. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's a phenomenon that's just now catching up in the U.S. But I mean, they were as fiercely popular. As, as whoever was spitting mm -hmm. the yes. uh, and that's spitting that that means rapping rhyming uh, not actually spitting and so i found that interesting when i when i traveled uh, mm -hmm. abroad particularly in europe that uh, there would be these huge concerts and it would just be the dj that's right. Uh, that's a great question. The question was, have I seen differences uh, between hip hop here and hip hop elsewhere? And he pointed out that DJs are extremely popular in, in Europe. That's absolutely true. They could have stadiums, uh, you know, concerts, just a DJ. Um, so the answer is yes. And one of the one of the really amazing things about hip hop is that it's so flexible. It can it can. Um, really what I'd say become indigenized. It can become in not just a, not a borrowed form, but an indigenous form. So when I went to Zimbabwe, they don't think that, that hip hop is borrowed from American. They think of it as Zimbabwean and they incorporate the mbira, which is a, a percussion instrument. They, they use their languages, Shona or Ndebele. Um, I've seen, you know, um, Bollywood dance uh, in India to hip hop. Um, so they, they absorb hip hop and they, and they connect it with what's popular there. So that's one of the great things about hip hop too is that they don't see it as just an American import, um, but they see it as theirs, but they also see that it uh, comes from America. So it has that kind of uh, uh, dual power that it's theirs, but also they recognize the authenticity of its American birth. So thank you. Thank you so much There's for coming tonight. Oh, is there another question? Oh, please go ahead and do that. OK, and I'm happy to talk afterwards, too. Yes. Do y'all help like, people to become professional artists? Yes, so if, if you didn't hear the question, do we help people to become professional artists? Yes, that's something that's really important that we do. Um, that's, uh, entrepreneurship is part of what we do. And we talk to them, we talk to the young people about how to, not just how to be a great rapper, but how to get how to do things like promoting themselves, branding themselves. We talk about contracts. Uh, we talk about professionalism. We talk about um, how to, um, you know, do uh, flyers and and social media. So we don't want. This is not just about entertainment. It's a way for them to find uh, to create their own livelihoods. And if they're not interested in becoming a professional hip hop artist, these lessons can also be applied to other other forms. So we want the entrepreneurship that we teach to be um, as broad reaching as possible. But that's something that's really important. And in fact, one quick thing, it's actually important to world peace, if you, because this may sound odd, but one of the, the greatest dangers in the world is young men without work. Um, and I'm serious. So um, that's, uh, so and it's usually men, but it could be women, but mostly young people who don't have something constructive to do in their lives, don't have a way to make money. That's where, uh, that's a breeding ground for, uh, you know, for strife, discontent, um, you know, terrorism. So to the extent that we can help people create um, a, a living for themselves, it actually helps promote stability in their countries too. Okay, well, thank you very much.